this week on Vaticano. Witness the John Paul II Awards at the Vatican and the first World Children's Day in Rome. Explore the miracle of the Eucharist in the Italian town of Lanciano and enjoy the latest edition of EWTN's Roman Nights. Plus, our series on the Pontifical Swiss Guards continues. For this and more, Vaticano starts now. This is how the celebration of World Children's Day began in Rome. The Pope received a group at the Vatican that traveled from war-torn countries, such as Ukraine and Palestine. Some of them lost their legs or arms during the conflict. Others lost their parents. The children fondly remembered the words of the pontiff. He's kind, because for me, the Papa is um, like a friend. After the meeting, the Pope visited the Roman Olympic Stadium where thousands of children were waiting for him. Delegations dressed in traditional costumes from each country inaugurated the event. It was a very musical occasion. Pope Francis remembered the children he had met that morning and made a call for peace addressed to the 50,000 children in the Olympic Stadium. Today, I receive children who have fled from Ukraine, who suffered greatly because of the wars. Some of them were injured. Is war a beautiful thing? The Pope wanted the children to speak as well. Luis Gabriel from Nicaragua asked him, why do some people have neither a home nor a job? So many people, so many countries spend money on buying weapons to destroy. Well, there are people who have nothing to eat. Boys and girls, think about this. There are children who don't have food. There are people who don't have jobs. And this is humanity's fault. I ask you a favor. Every day, when you say your prayers, pray for the children who suffer from this injustice. Today, Louis Gabriel has touched our hearts. The theme of this celebration was a passage from the Bible, I make all things new. With this, the Pope wanted to invite the faithful to be like children who see life with eyes full of wonder. The celebration continued on Sunday in St. Peter's Square during the solemnity of the Most Holy Trinity. And we pray to God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. How many gods are there? One in three. Faith makes you happy, and we believe in God who is altogether Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Altogether, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. During the meeting, the Pope announced the next World Children's Day will be celebrated in September of 2026. Decades after John Paul II's passing, his pontificate is increasingly viewed as a historic era. However, his teachings continue to inspire the modern church. To honor this legacy, the Vatican's John Paul II Foundation established the Premio Giovanni Paolo II, the John Paul II Prize. The prize acknowledges those who embody the teachings of the Polish Pope and supports individuals and institutions exploring his legacy. The inaugural recipient is the Justice and Peace Center in Kampala, Uganda. The impact that the Polish Pope has made to Africa was great. In 1995, there was Ecclesia in Africa, a very important document of the Synod. So taking this all into consideration, I think that that was the simplest idea, to remember our the Africa on the way as the Pope John Paul II has remembered the continent. For the center, this is a great privilege, but also an obligation to do even more. It is an encouragement that, you know, we have, we have been appreciated. Now, after the appreciation, then what? Do we now sleep? No, I think it is a moment that we now have to work harder, 
do better and see which are the loopholes that we need to fill up and who are those that we need to bring on board so that the message goes wider than ourselves and everybody where possible should participate in working for human dignity. The center promotes the inviolable dignity of every human being, combats human trafficking, cares for street children in Kampala, and works intensively with refugees. During the ceremony at the Apostolic Palace, the director of the awarded center received a special statue featuring two hands, reminiscent of Michelangelo's work in the Sistine Chapel. I tried to convey the spirit of love and steadfastness of faith of that Pope and the message he wanted to leave us, that heaven is connected to earth. With this prize, the Vatican Foundation of John Paul II aims to inspire and strengthen the spirit of those who embrace and seek inspiration from the thought of John Paul II. Welcome to this week's Vaticano Updates, the most important news from the Holy Father and the Vatican. Pope Francis has authorized the recognition of miracles attributed to several blessed, paving the way for their canonization. Amongst them are Carlo Acutis, Giuseppe Alamano, Maria Leonie Paradis, and Elena Guerra. The Vatican also announced the recognition of martyrdoms of Maria Madalena Bodhi, a laywoman killed in Hungary in 1945, and Stanislav Kostas Strike, a Polish diocesan priest murdered while celebrating Mass in 1938. After less than a year of service, Archbishop Gabriel Antonio Mestre resigned as the Metropolitan Archbishop of La Plata in Argentina. He succeeded Cardinal Fernandez, the Vatican's doctrinal chief. The Holy See did not provide a reason for his resignation. No to female deacons. In an interview with CBS News, Pope Francis was asked if women will ever have the opportunity to become deacons and participate in the church's clergy. His answer was clear. While emphasizing the importance of women in the church, Francis stated that this does not mean they could be deacons with holy orders. Speaking at an interfaith symposium on palliative care in Toronto, Pope Francis emphasized that authentic palliative care is radically different from euthanasia. He said, it is never a source for hope or genuine concerns for the sick and dying. Quoting his encyclical Fagelli Tutti, Pope Francis called in his video statement, euthanasia, a failure of love, a reflection of a throwaway culture where people are no longer seen as a paramount value to be cared for and respected. Urging the abolition of human trafficking, Pope Francis called it one of the most terrible scourges of our time. He said, human trafficking disrespects human dignity and delivers large profits to the unscrupulous. However, the Holy Father encouraged per perseverance, stating that with the power of the Spirit of Jesus Christ and the dedication of many, it is possible to eliminate it. Thank you for watching this week's Vaticano Updates. Andreas Tonhauser for EWTN Vaticano. In a few moments, we'll explore the miracle of the Eucharist in the Italian town of Lanciano. said to Thomas, have you come to believe because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and have believed. The moment in the mass when the bread and wine become the body and blood of Christ is known as the consecration. This occurs during the Eucharistic prayer, which is the most solemn part of the mass. The doctrine of the real presence in Catholicism holds that Jesus Christ is truly present, body, blood, soul, and divinity in the Eucharist. In the body and blood of Christ, we find his presence, his life given for each of us. Adoring the body and blood of Christ lets us ask him with our heart, Lord, give me that daily bread to go forward. 
and satisfy me with your presence. This year, Pope Francis celebrates the Feast of Corpus Christi outdoors for the first time since the pandemic. The feast honors the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist, that he is truly present in his body, blood, soul, and divinity. Eucharistic miracles further attest to the profound truth, beauty, and inexhaustible mystery of the Eucharist. The first recorded miracle occurred in the Italian town of Lanciano. Custodian of the relic, Brother Santino Verna, helps us rediscover one of the greatest events in the history of the church. The miracle occurred in the first half of the 8th century, where a priest who remained anonymous and who was never given a conventional baptism had doubts about transubstantiation. Eucharistic miracles, according to the Catholic Church, speak profoundly about the nature of faith, the significance of the sacraments, and the power of divine intervention. The host became a part of the left ventricle, which is the part of the human body that is essential for the heart's function. And this part of the myocardial tissue was aching and bleeding. The blood then clotted, while the wine turned into human blood and within a few moments changed from a liquid to a solid state. For the faithful, these miracles are a call to deepen their faith. They're seen as signs from God, meant to strengthen belief in the mysteries of the Christian faith that are beyond human understanding. These events encourage a more profound reverence for the sacraments and inspire a more fervent participation in communal worship and prayer. What do Eucharistic miracles say to us? Eucharistic miracles are seen as profound expressions of God's ongoing engagement with and love for the world offering both a mystery to ponder and a catalyst for deeper spiritual commitment. The preservation itself is a miracle. In fact, it has even been studied and investigated through the works of Professor Eduardo Linoli. If we put water on the host transformed into human flesh, which is precisely laser cut, we see that it starts to redden because it is dehydrated flesh. There is no chemical powder used for preservation. Since the 8th century, the Italian town of Lanciano has borne witness to the real presence in the Eucharist. We should never forget that each time we attend Mass, we witness a miracle. back the Gospel of St. Luke, uh, the Parabola dei Talenti. If you have talents, you've got to give them back. There's no need to put them underground. Whenever we encounter a poor person, we cannot look away, for that would prevent us from encountering the face of the Lord Jesus. Around 700 million people live on less than $2.15 a day the extreme poverty line. After decades of progress, the pace of global poverty reduction began to slow by 2015, in tandem with subdued economic growth. The sustainable development goal of ending extreme poverty by 2030 remains out of reach. When we think of the immense numbers of the poor in our midst, the message of today's gospel is clear. Let us not bury the wealth of the Lord. Let us spread the wealth of charity, share our bread, and multiply love. Thank you 
so much uh, for taking the time being with us to speak about church and charity, about the gospel in action. We are in um, a beautiful place, which is also a legend legendary place for us in Sant'Egidio because this is the first soup kitchen founded by Sant'Egidio. This edition of Roman Nights was held at the community of Sant'Egidio Soup Kitchen on Via Dandolo No. 10 in Rome. More than 200,000 people have been welcomed in the over 30 years that it's been open, and more than 3 million meals have been served. And you can consider this place as a sort of a school of solidarity for thousands of people. Myself also, I have learned what solidarity means in this place. Uh, this is a soup kitchen, it gives food uh, to thousands of people every week. But it is also a place in which poor people are the best guests, are the honor guests. Lack of food is one of the most serious aspects of poverty. The first community soup kitchen was made in Rome out of such awareness. Many charitable efforts depend on the generosity and support of the wider business community. On the panel was Marco Maximilian Elser, an Italian-American businessman and investor with deep commitments to charitable initiatives. He's on the board of the Fondazione Operation Smile Italy that has treated hundreds of thousands of children born with cleft lip and cleft palate. Without this care, the lives of these children would be very difficult. Underdeveloped world, you are not able to drink milk from your mother, you are ostracized, you're considered a devil, a demon, and you are set aside. And with a 45-minute piece of surgery, your life changed like this. And when the child who's seen himself as a monster uh, <laughs> looks himself in the mirror or herself in the mirror clean, the smile they have is, it, it's goosebumps, it's... For all your life, uh, Present on the panel was Sister Santina Bartolini, a devoted caretaker and missionary from the Pope John XXIII community. Sister Santina has dedicated her life to serving the needy across multiple continents, from Italy to Zambia. Sister Santina shared with the audience how everyone is capable of giving love and that no life is disposable. In the relationship with people, I understood that no matter how handicapped you are, there is so much love that you can give. And uh, Filippo was brought to us uh, when he was five years old and he was uh, weighing five kgs. And, um, People looking at him said, we brought you a vegetable. And uh, instead, uh, myself, I saw something extremely beautiful. And living with him, I understood that uh, it is love that gives you, that give, uh, you the, the real uh, understanding of what is beauty. In our daily lives, whether in bustling cities, quiet urban towns, or the serene countryside, many individuals are forced to live on the streets for a variety of reasons. Their lives are often marked by poverty, isolation, invisibility, and sometimes even contempt. However, simple acts of kindness, stopping for a chat, offering help, or extending friendship can make a profound difference. These gestures embody the spirit of the Good Samaritan and put the gospel into action bridging the gap of indifference and bringing light into the lives of those who need it most. Next on Vaticano, we resume our series on the Pontifical Swiss Guards, revealing to you the charisms and virtues they develop during their military training and spiritual formation as protectors of the Holy Father.
Between the morning's holy mass and the evening swearing-in ceremony on the 6th of May, the new recruits received a private audience in the Apostolic Palace with Pope Francis. This day gives me an opportunity to publicly express my thanks for the presence and service of the Swiss Guard. You demonstrate a high level of motivation and willingness to serve, and I'm also very pleased with that and with the good relations among yourselves. Good relations are the high road to our human and Christian growth and maturation. It is not just the period of work, but a time, a time of life, of relationship, of intense fellowship in a diverse company. Today, it is widespread among young people to spend their free time alone with their computer or cell phone. Therefore, I also say to you young guards, go against the current. The Pontifical Swiss Guard has a very unique atmosphere because we have the joy of being among fellow countrymen every day. So I would say that first of all, it's a very Swiss environment, right? When one enters the barracks, especially the visitors, when they enter, I greet those who are coming from Switzerland, and they say, but wow, are we in Switzerland? Here is not the Vatican. I must say, there is a strong camaraderie present here, because we are, first of all, a huge family. We are a community, obviously a military community. And therefore, we have a very high discipline. We require every single guard to be according to the regulations. In the month leading up to the swearing-in ceremony, the new recruits take a series of basic training tests to meet military regulations. The first on the list was the sport test. One of the guards responsible for examining the fitness of new recruits is Vice Corporal Matthias Roth. All recruits do this when they join the guard. It has to be passed. And if you don't pass initially, you repeat until you pass. It is a basic fitness test where you have to have a certain level of endurance. You have to be agile. But at the same time, strong enough in order to pass. Every guardsman is responsible for his own sporting level. We simply check this once a year for the troops, twice a year for the squads, and for those who also go on the paper trips. And we have a fitness room that has weights and an indoor gym and where, of course, you can let off some steam after work. But it's up to everyone to decide what they want to do. You can also go cycling and you can go running out in Rome. There are options for playing various sports here in Rome that include rowing. We have a guard group who plays football and there are lots of different ways to keep fit. For some of the listed requirements, one must be Swiss, male and above 174 centimeters or 5 feet 8 inches tall to join the guard. Although non-Swiss Catholics are excluded from joining their ranks, everyone can still learn from their training exercises and the guard's wisdom and expertise. Uno, due, tre. Very good. The most important thing is your own consistency. You must keep training every day, or at least every other day. I focus on small workouts, and you don't have to want to go from 0 to 100 straight away. You should try to build up your own routine slowly, with simple exercises, carrying out the exercises properly every day, or as I said, at least every other day. I believe, and I am convinced, noticing the progress in myself too, this is ultimately the key to sporting success.
The key places where the guards engage with the public are at the exterior posts, where they protect entrances but also welcome residents of Vatican City, answer questions from pilgrims, and distribute tickets for papal audiences. In the Swiss Guard, normally in the first 26 months, a bit of classic work is done, i.e. the protection of the Vatican, the century service, various, let's say, classic services that the public doesn't normally see. Then, after these 26 months, you can, according to the availability of the Swiss Guard, grow. Someone can become a non-commissioned officer, and therefore began a training course for escorting the Pope. On the next episode of Vaticano, we take a closer look at their various responsibilities and training to keep the Holy Father out of harm's way and bring you inside the armory where past and present meet in full force. <laughs>